Oh, okay, so okay, so welcome everybody. And we're, you know, working with the Pathwork lectures and oftentimes, you know, we just go to the pathwork.org. Can everybody hear me okay? Good. Yes. Okay. So pathwork.org for, you know, using the the lectures as we can download them or listen to them from there. But a while back I decided I wanted to just kind of go through this book that's published it's on amazon you can get it you know on just kindle which is what i'm you know reading from and it has a series of kind of the really great lectures you know sort of the best loved ones some of them are a little bit edited to kind of add some pieces so they're not exactly always the the, the total lectures but i find that this is a good presentation so we've just been going through them and we're on chapter six, and this is the lecture on the forces of love, eros, and sex. So um, again, I just kind of am reading through the lecture, discussing as we go. Feel free to interrupt with questions or comments. And this will go ahead and begin this reading. So the editor is kind of this little parentheses uh, paragraph is, coming from them, and then we start with the guide's words. So they're saying, since the dualistic state, which is the lecture we looked at last time, expresses itself on the level of our bodies as the two sexes, uh, we might just as well continue with this lecture on love, eros, and sex, um, a particular favorite. And it says, no one is exempt from the touch or sometimes even the onslaught of these forces. And this lecture sheds light on the confusion that exists in all of us whenever we love or desire and helps to sort out the contradic contradictory feelings. How to keep Eros, that is the question. So, and, you know, this lecture doesn't have a lot on it, but there's, you know, like, it's one of these lectures that kind of, when these were originally done was back in the 50s through the 70s. And, you know, so it's kind of pretty much a heterosexually based understanding of things and of course now we're in a time where there's people expressing and experiencing you know sexuality and in very different ways and so i think you know it's it's like there's some ways that we sometimes to you know work with the inclusion i would just suggest that you know people can also like really listen to this no matter where they are in that identification right you know in their gender identity on their sexuality identity or whatever that that this lecture kind of applies across the board. So, you know, like we say, greetings in the name of the Lord. I bring you blessings, my dearest friends. Blessed is this hour. Tonight, I would like to discuss three particular forces in the universe. The love force, as it manifests between the sexes or between partners, right? You know, the erotic force and the sexual force. So these are three distinctly different principles or the sex force. So, you know, and he's he's here talking about them as energies, as principles, as forces, right? That uh, manifest differently on different planes and on every plane from the highest to the lowest. And humanity has confused these three principles. In fact, it is little known that the three separate forces exist and what the differences between them are. There is so much confusion about this that it will be quite useful to clear them up. So he begins with the spiritual meaning of the erotic force. And the erotic force is one of the most potent forces in existence and has tremendous momentum and impact. It is supposed to serve as the bridge between sex and love, yet it rarely does. In a spiritually highly developed person, the erotic force carries the entity from the erotic experience, which in itself is of short duration, into the permanent state of pure love. So, you know, when we think of eros or we think of, you know, sort of falling in love, the honeymoon phase, you know, is kind of like what I think he's talking about here, you know, and and in a way, like, I think later on in this lecture, he talks about, you know, it's like we need this very powerful arrows current you know because otherwise people would be you know like kind of averse to coming together connecting right you know so there's this powerful sort of magnetizing 
force sometimes between us that, you know, was meant to help us break through our state of separation and start connecting. And then from there, like more than just the Eros, you know, the love force would also come into play. But Eros is also a very beautiful, you know, gift for us and and it doesn't have to go. And so he talks about this in this, this lecture, you know, how can we, because that feeling of being in love, that feeling of, you know, just sort of falling in love and really kind of being head over heels about the other person, you know, it's like, it can't keep up forever. It has to have a balance, you know, and be realistic, but, but just the appreciation and deep attraction to our partners, right. You know, the, the feeling of, you know, continued eros, eros for them, you know, through us is I think a very beautiful part of our partnerships when we can maintain it. So he says, um, where did I leave off here? Uh, However, even the strong momentum of the erotic force carries the soul just so far and no further. It is bound to dissolve if the personality does not learn to love by cultivating all the qualities and requirements necessary for true love. Only when love has been learned does the spark of the erotic force remain alive. By itself, without love, the erotic force burns itself out. This, of course, is the trouble with marriage. Since most people are incapable of pure love, they are also incapable of attaining ideal marriage. Eros seems in many ways similar to love. It brings forth impulses a human being would not have otherwise, impulses of unselfishness and affection he or she might have been incapable of before. This is why Eros is very often confused with love. But Eros is just as often confused with the sex instinct, which like Eros also manifests as a great urge. <clears throat> now, my friends, I would like to show you what the spiritual meaning and purpose of the erotic force is, particularly as far as humanity is concerned. Without Eros, many people would never experience the great feeling and beauty that is contained in real love. They would never get the taste of it, and the yearning for love would remain deeply submerged in their souls. Their fear of love would remain stronger than their desire. Eros is the nearest thing to love the undeveloped spirit can experience. It lifts the soul out of sluggishness, out of mere contentment and vegetation. It causes the soul to surge, to go out of itself. When this force comes upon even the most undeveloped people, they become able to surpass themselves. Even a criminal will temporarily feel at least toward one person a goodness he has never known. The utterly selfish person will, while this feeling lasts, have unselfish impulses. Lazy people will get out of their inertia. The routine bound person will naturally and without effort get rid of static habits. The erotic force will lift a person out of separateness, be it only for a short time. Eros gives the soul a foretaste of unity and teaches the fearful psyche the longing for it. The more strongly one has experienced Eros, the less contentment will the soul find in the pseudo-security of separateness. Even an otherwise thoroughly self-centered person may be able to make a sacrifice during the experience of Eros. So you see, my friends, Eros enables people to do things they are disinclined to do otherwise, things that are closely linked with love. It is easy to see why Eros is often confused with love. So the difference between Eros and love. Any comments, questions here? Let me pause. So how then is Eros different from love? Love is a permanent state in the soul. Eros is not. Love can only exist if the foundation for it is prepared through development and purification. Love does not come and go at random. Eros does. Eros hits with sudden force, often taking a person unawares and even finding him or her unwilling to go through the experience. Only if the soul is prepared to love 
and has built the foundation for it, will Eros be the bridge to love that is manifest between a man and a woman or partners. Thus you can see how important the erotic force is. Without the erotic force hitting them and getting them out of their rut, many human beings would never be ready for a more conscious search for the breaking down of their own walls of separation. The erotic experience puts the seed into the soul and makes it long for unity, which is the great aim in the plan of salvation. As long as the soul is separate, loneliness and unhappiness must be its lot. The erotic experience enables the personality to long for union with at least one other being. In the heights of the spirit world, union exists among all beings, and thus with God. In this earth sphere, the erotic force is a propelling power regardless of whether or not its real meaning is understood. This is even though it is often misused and enjoyed for its own sake while it lasts. It is not cultivated to, it is not utilized to cultivate love in the soul, so it peters out. Nevertheless, its effect will inevitably reign, remain in the soul. So the fear of Eros and the fear of love. So Eros comes to people suddenly in certain stages of their life, even to those who are afraid of the apparent risks of adventuring away from separateness. People who are afraid of their emotions and afraid of life as such will often do anything in their power to avoid, both subconsciously and ignorantly, the great experience of unity. Although this fear exists in many human beings, there are few indeed who have not experienced some opening in the soul where arrows could touch them. For the fear-ridden soul that resists the experience, this is good medicine, regardless of the fact that sorrow and loss may follow due to other psychological factors. However, there are also those who are over-emotional, and although they may know other fears of life, they are not afraid of this particular experience. In fact, the beauty of it is a great temptation to them, and therefore they hunt greedily for it. Right, you know, this is like being in love with being in love, right? You know, and they and they look for one subject after another, emotionally too ignorant to understand the deep meaning of eros. They are unwilling to learn pure love and simply use the erotic force for their pleasure. And when it is worn out, they hunt elsewhere. This is an abuse and cannot continue without ill effects. Such a personality will have to make amends for the abuse, even if it was done in ignorance. In the same vein, the too fearful coward will have to make up for trying to cheat life by hiding from Eros, and thus withholding from the soul a medicine valuable if properly used. Most people in this category have a vulnerable point somewhere in their soul through which Eros can enter. There are also a few who have built such a tight wall of fear and pride around their souls that they avoid this part of life experience entirely, and so shortchange their own development. This fear might exist because in a former life, they had an unhappy experience with Eros, or perhaps because the soul has greedily abused the beauty of the erotic force without building it into love. In either case, Let's see, I just let Elizabeth in, so let me find where I was. Let's see. In either case, welcome, Elizabeth. <laughs> Hi. Hey. Hey. We're just reading through, so feel free to, you know, come in with comments or questions. We're, you know, reading in the Kindle version on the lecture on love, arrows, and sex. So um, we started just a little while ago, but we're into it a little ways. So, uh, so it says... He's talking about the, the erotic force and, you know, kind of fear of love and also fear of eros. And he says, in either case, the personality may have chosen to be more careful. If this decision is too rigid and stringent, the opposite extreme will follow. In the next incarnation, circumstances will be chosen in such a way that a balance is established until the soul reaches a harmonious state, wherein there are no more extremes. This balancing in future incarnations always applies to all aspects of the personality. In order to approach this harmony, 
to some extent at least, the proper balance between reason, emotion, and will has to be achieved. The erotic experience often mingles with the sexual urge, but it does not always have to be that way. These three forces, love, eros, and sex, often appear completely separately, while sometimes too mingle, such as eros and sex or eros and love. And to the extent the soul is capable of love or sex and a semblance of love, only in the ideal case do all three forces mingle harmoniously. So ultimately the goal is to kind of have a, a harmonious balance of, of all of these. So now he's going into the sex force, which he hasn't talked about yet before. So the sex Can force. Can I ask a question real quick? Sure, Selena, go ahead. Um, so I didn't get a chance to read through this before, so I'm kind of just following along. And, right. Um, so I'm. I guess I'm trying to understand what eros is because I think I missed something. Okay. Yeah. He he kind of defines it, and he kind of does out throughout the lecture, but it is a little bit of of kind of the one mystery there. So if you think of. Arrow says the 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 desire, you know, and appreciate like it's kind of like that falling in love with someone, you know, like where you've kind of been smitten, you know, or you're, you know, so it's it has maybe some sexual component, you know, but there's really like, you know, you're loving the the way the person is being, you know, and showing up and that attracts you. And 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 if that's reciprocal, you know, there's this really beautiful time often in the beginning of a relationship where you're kind of feeding off of each other's, you know, light in that way. And so one person will bring out, you know, uh, more of what we even know is in ourselves, right? Because we're kind of reflected in their light. And and so we experience ourselves in a more lightful beauty and, you know, more clever, more loving, more whatever, you know, in this state of Eros. Um, and often, you know, it's like this, you know, reciprocal kind of honeymoon phase in the relationship. Now, eventually that's going to shift. And often, you know, if the relationship is going to last, we have to, you know, do you really love me? You know, and that means, can you deal with my lower self or my negativity? And of course, we, we want to have our partners be also our teachers and help us learn how to transform that. But you know, we really can't be a partnership unless we're in equalness and we can't be just in the mask, uh, you know, or just sustaining Eros unless it comes into a deeper, true love. So does that help? Yeah, I, I think so. So Eros is kind of like this free love. And that's my own definition from what you said. But yeah. it can it can wane. You know, that's what Valentine's Day is all about, right? You know, Cupid pulling back mm -hmm. the bowstring, you know, and striking the heart, you know. And so people, you know, fall in love, you know, with each other. And, you know, I don't know, maybe people don't do that anymore. But, you know, you know, sexuality was, you know, sometimes involved in that, like he says, you know, but but oftentimes, you know, there's just this. I remember when I met my husband, right, you know, like there was just some kind of essence to his being that immediately attracted me, made me feel at, at ease, you know, and, and that, you know, beautifully, you know, turned into mature love, you know, and stuff. But, you know, there was that initial attraction force and, okay. and, and then so that, that attraction what... force kind of calls forth you know, out of ourselves, our, our highest in some way. I'm sorry, you were saying something else? So this attraction force, that's what the Eros is? Mm -hmm. I would say it's okay. the inspiration behind the courtship. Okay. Mm -hmm. I like that, inspiration, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's the, it's the energy of falling in love, mm -hmm. you know, but it's usually in the beginning, it's not... You know, it's not that permanent, mature, deep love. You know, it's it's like, mm -hmm. you know, it's giddy. It's, you know, a kind of high. It's a kind of, you know, I can't stop thinking about the guy you know, or the girl or, okay. you know, or okay. whoever. So, so, you know, where, where does it go? Does it dissipate? Yeah, that's what he's saying. And he said it doesn't have to, but it generally does, you know, and he's saying that it, it will unless you also 
cultivate mature love. But he gets into that a little bit later on in the lecture. So let's let's okay. see if that can be answered, you know, as we go. Um, okay. But yeah, good questions. And, you know, so so it's important to kind of get these distinctions, you know, for, for these purposes. And, and to recognize, you know, when we're, you know, like, like in a relationship, like he said, you know, all three are really the, the best combination. And oftentimes, you know, we're in a relationship where maybe, you know, it's a long-term relationship and we even kind of like each other or love each other in a kind of a way, you know, but maybe, you know, sex is kind of faded or maybe we have, you know, the sex still, you know, and when we're really into the sex, you know, there's some kind of more love, but, you know, in general, we don't, you know, feel that. And and in those cases, you know, Eros usually isn't there. Now, when there's real love, you know, like, like the guy later on, he talks about, you know, Eros is the adventure of exploring another soul. And he says, we should never really let run out of Eros because a soul is so vast we can never know the soul completely, but there's something in our consciousness that goes into, you know, kind of expectation. And we know that person and we, we think we're going, you know, they're going to be this way. And so in our, you know, assumptions and, and just kind of the way that we are, we kind of create these ruts and, and, and they're sort of self-fulfilling prophecies as well. So like when there isn't this mystery of the other person that we are continuing to uncover like, you know, a new Christmas present every year or something, right? You know, like, and when we don't recognize in that person that mystery that we can never fully know, you know, um, then we can't keep arrows. But, you know, if we have a mature love and then we also recognize, you know, the the, the beauty of the mystery of of our, you know, the person that we care about, you know, and, and keep you know, supporting them in revealing more and more of their self. And then that's kind of a benign circle where that also often, you know, has them do the same, you know, in reciprocation. And and then the two souls are kind of just, you know, mirroring each other's light in this beautiful way. And that very seldom happens, obviously, right? You know, most of the time it's the opposite. We're in a tug of war, we're mirroring each other's darkness, you know, and and the you know the arrows may have brought us together initially but the love didn't get mature and the sex is maybe still there or not but it's kind of separated from the whole connected place so when people say like you got to work at it is that to maintain the arrows i think so and i mean there's many many things like in the path work the guide talks about you know how oftentimes unconsciously we're you know, trying to resolve all of our problems with our partners, right? And and we don't recognize that we're sort of doing that and we're taking our, our past from our childhood and kind of <coughs> recreating it in the present. And so there's a, there's a lot going on. You know, there's a lot of lectures that the guide has on the spiritual importance of relationship and kind of these dynamics that prevent us from you know, connecting and being in this tug of war, you know, and all of our old wounds and how they get connected with it as well. But, you know, this is kind of one of the lectures that that covers these issues. And, um, you know, so we're, we're a lot, the guide is a lot about learning how to have mature love, right? You know, and most of us have what he calls, you know, an immature kind of understanding of things. And so, the the deeper journey into true love is an evolutionary journey and like so by you know exploring and understanding some of these forces and helping them you know utilizing them working with them in the way that they can help us and reveal and and help us transform versus using them unconsciously and getting lost in them so um so the extension is in other lectures or in this lecture? The the extension, is that what you were I didn't hear the word. Yeah, I said extension, but you said the guy has many 
Yeah, there are okay. other, you know, there are many lectures. There's like 258 lectures. There's a book okay. that's available called Creating Union, which is mm -hmm. like a compilation of the lectures on relationship. Okay. And so, you know, that might be, and, and it's not just the man, you know, women or just the, you know, primary relationship, although there's a lot about that because our primary relationships are very much about our evolution and, you know, and consciousness. And, and so, and it's kind of the first place where we're trying to learn how to love, right. You know, and where we're really working through that stuff, but it's, it's our relationship to nature and life and, and also, you know, bosses and, you know, children and everybody in the world at some level, you know, humanity in general. And so there's, you know, several lectures that, that cover a, a lot of that stuff. Did that, was that helping you follow? Yeah. I mean, I can yeah, send that. you a link, you know, to where you can access these lectures and explore them. Um, we just kind of read through one as we, you know, every two weeks. And so you can also just mm -hmm. kind of belong here too. Okay. Okay. That, um, no, that helps. I was confused with the three different things I was just trying to figure out, but that helped. Right. I mean, there's, you know, this lecture is specifically on this love, eros and sex and the different, you know, aspects of these forces. The guide is a lot about, you know, the forces of the universe. And so, so he's, he's going into the sex force now. And he says the sex force is the creative force on any level of existence. So, you know, we often think of it just in terms of, you know, like procreation on the, you know, physical level of our human sexuality. But, you know, he's saying that it's actually the force that's behind that is a larger, more generalized creative force that uh, is you know, functional on anything that's created, right? So in the highest spheres, the same sex force creates spiritual life, spiritual ideas, spiritual concepts and principles. <clears throat> I don't know, for some reason, you know, it's coming to me like in the Christian, you know, the concept of, you know, immaculate conception, right? You know, in some way, you know, that feels like to me sort of the spiritual expression of the, uh, the, the sex force in that sense, you know? Uh, on the lower planes, the pure and unspiritualized sex force creates life as it manifests in that particular sphere. It creates the outer shell or vehicle of the entity destined to live in that sphere. The pure sex force is utterly selfish. Sex without eros and without love is referred to as an animalistic, as animalistic. Pure sex as the reproductive force exists in all living creatures, animals, plants, and minerals. Eros begins with the stage of development where the soul is incarnated as a human being. And I think sometimes the guide, you know, is a little parochial on this. I don't know. When I look at animals, I think they have Eros too and stuff like that. But, you know, we can accept that, you know, he's speaking here, you know, specifically around human Eros. And it begins at the stage of development where the soul is incarnated as a human being. When pure love is to be found in the higher spiritual realms. So this does not mean that Eros and sex no longer exist in beings of higher development, but rather that all three blend in harmoniously and are refined and become less and less selfish. So does that make sense? You know, and you might think in your relationships, you know, about that kind of selfish part, you know, like the love is the opposite of the, you know, give me, you know, giving. Uh, and and so, you know, all of these forces, you know, can, you know, be more or less selfish. And as we refine and balance, then they become less and less selfish. More aligned in sort of the unitive state of caring for each other deeply, and then the more deeply we care, you know, the the more depth in the sexual experience, the more depth in the eros, the more depth in the love. So he says, no, nor do I mean that a human being should not try to achieve our, har our har a harmonious blend of all three forces. In cases, in rare cases. Eros alone, without sex and love, exists for a limited time. 
This is usually referred to as platonic love. But sooner or later, with the somewhat healthy person, eros and sex will mingle. The sex force, instead of being suppressed, is taken up by the erotic force, and both flow in one current. The more the three forces remain separate, the unhealthier the personality is. So I don't know if that makes sense, you know, it's like, but, you know, something to kind of tune into, right? You know, that the more that they remain separate, the more unhealthy, and then, you know, like, sex will lead into the arrows, into the love, you know, and I don't know if it always happens that way. I know, you know, a lot of times women, it's more like starting with the arrows that, that makes the connection and then the sex, you know, and for men, a lot of times somehow the sex allows for the connection and the arrows to happen it is kind of a general understanding. I don't know if that's a truism or not, but so, you know, there, there's this way though that, you know, it's, it's bridging. And so the sex force, instead of being suppressed, can be taken up and, and then harmonized and refined. Another frequent combination, particularly in relationships of long standing, is the coexistence of genuine love with sex, but without eros. Although love can not be perfect unless all three forces blend together, there is a certain amount of affection, companionship, fondness, mutual respect, and a sexual relationship that, you know, is purely physical, you know, without that erotic spark that may have evaporated some time ago. So, you know, you can love somebody and still enjoy sex with them, but you may not have that kind of, you know, hot eros involved, you know, or that deep attraction somehow, but just the beautiful, you know, simple loving and the sexual expression. So when Eros is missing, the sexual relationship can, he says, must eventually suffer. But I don't know that that's, you know, always true. And I think in some ways, you know, if there is that respect and that mutuality and stuff, there is some Eros present. So I think he's like a little bit too rigid in the divisions here, but he's trying to make a point about how these things are different. So now this is the problem with most marriages, my friends. There's hardly a human being who is not puzzled by the question of what to do in a relationship to maintain the spark that seems to evaporate the more habit and familiarity with one another set in. So this is where, you know, how do we make arrows stay? Because it's a beautiful thing and we don't want to lose that spark. And, and when we can have all three, it's even, you know, the best. So you may not have posed the question in terms of three distinct forces, yet you know and sense that something goes out of a marriage that was present at the beginning. That spark is actually arrows. You find yourself in a vicious circle and think that marriage is a hopeless proposition. No, my friends, it is not, even if you cannot as yet attain the ideal. So then he talks about the ideal partnership of love. In the ideal partnership of love between two people, all three forces have to be represented. With love, you do not seem to have much difficulty, for in most cases, one would not marry if there did not exist at least some, at least the willingness to love. I will not discuss at this point the extreme cases where this is not so. I am focusing on a relationship where the choice is a mature one, and yet the partners can not get around the pitfall of becoming bound by time and habit because elusive eros has disappeared. With sex, it is very much the same. The sex force is present in most healthy human beings and may only begin to fade, particularly with women, when eros has left. Men may then seek eros elsewhere. For the sexual relationship must eventually suffer unless Eros is maintained. So how can you keep Eros? That is the big question, my dear ones. Eros can be maintained only if it is used as a bridge to true partnership in love in the highest sense. How is this done? The search for the other soul. Let us look <laughs> for the main element in the erotic force. When you analyze it, you will find 
that it is the adventure, the search for the knowledge of the other soul. This desire lives in every created spirit. The inherent life force must finally bring the entity out of its separation. Arrow strengthens the curiosity to know the other being. As long as there is something new to find in the other soul, as long as you reveal yourself to each other, right? You know, because if you're holding back or you're hiding, you know, you can't, you can't find that Eros. Eros is going to live. So we have to be both looking into the other soul to seek more, and we also have to be willing to reveal ourselves to let the other person find us. So the moment you believe you have found all there is to find and have revealed all there is to reveal, Eros will leave. It is as simple as that with Eros. But where your great error comes in is that you believe there is a limit to the revealing of any soul, yours or another's. When a certain point of usually quite superficial revelation is reached, you are under the impression that that is all there is, and you settle down to a placid life without further searching. Eros has carried you this far with its strong impact, but after this point, your will to further search the unlimited depths of the other person and voluntarily reveal and share your own inward search determines whether you have used Eros as a bridge to love. This, in turn, is always determined by your will to learn how to love. Only in this way will you maintain the spark of Eros in your love. Only in this way will you continue to find the other and let yourself be found. You know, and, and so this is a kind of generative, you know, sharing and giving forthness, you know, that has to happen and a seeking and a, and a welcoming of the other. And often the relationship more gets like into a tug of war, you know, of, you know, what we want from each other and what they're not giving us and how we're mad at them because they won't give us how we want it, you know, and that kind of thing. So it's kind of like the opposite. So we go into this, you know, trying to get love instead of trying to give love. And that's a, another lecture he talks about that, you know, that's the difference between, you know, the child's, you know, need for love and the adult's need to give love. You know, he says that the, the real need of the adult is different than the need of the child. And when we still stay trapped in our child's need to get love from the lacks of our childhood that have been unfulfilled, you know, we carry it over into our relationships and that's where we get all tangled up. So that's several other lectures that uh, are, you know, in this body of wisdom here. So, only in this way will you continue to find the other and let yourself be found. There is no limit, for the soul is endless and eternal. A whole lifetime would not suffice to know it. There can never be a point when you know the other soul entirely, nor when you are known entirely. The soul is alive, and nothing that is alive remains static, it has the capacity to reveal even deeper layers that already exist. The soul is also in constant change and movement as anything spiritual is by its very nature. Spirit means life and life means change. Since soul is spirit, the soul can never be known utterly. If people had the wisdom, they would realize that and make of marriage the marvelous journey of adventure it is supposed to be instead of simply being carried as far as you are taken by the first momentum of Eros. You should use this potent momentum of Eros as the initial thrust it is, and then find through it the urge to go on further under your own steam. And then you will have brought Eros into true love in marriage. The Pitfalls of Marriage Marriage is intended by God for human beings, and its divine purpose is not merely procreation. That is only one aspect. So this is also where, you know, we can let go of sort of the binary limits that have historically been 
placed and even to the guide to a certain extent. And there are questions about, you know, like, well, you know, so people need to read and make up their own decisions. But in my own beliefs, I feel, feel, feel like, you know, most of this is just universal. And so he's saying there is only one, you know, one the one aspect of, you know, marriage is procreation. And the spiritual idea of marriage is to enable the soul to reveal itself and to be constantly on the search for the other, to discover forever new vistas of the other being. The more this happens, the happier the marriage will be, the more firmly and safely it will be rooted, and the less it will be in danger of an unhappy ending. Thus, it will fulfill its spiritual purpose. And so what's the spiritual purpose of the marriage? To enable the soul to reveal itself and to also be constantly on the search to, you know, see the other, to discover forever new vistas of the other being. In practice, however, marriage hardly ever works that way. You reach a certain state of familiarity and habit. You think you know the other. It does not even occur to you that the other does not know you by any means. He or she may know certain facts of your being, but that is all. This search for the other being as well as for self-revelation requires inner activity and alertness. But since people are often tempted into inner inactivity, while outer activity may be all the stronger as an overcompensation, they are being lured to sink into a state of restfulness, cherishing the delusion of already knowing each other fully. You know, there's a kind of comfortable place we can settle in, right? You know, of taking each other for granted in a way, I think is partly what he's, you know, talking about here. And again, you know, there is a, a, a beautiful comfort in being deeply comfortable with each other, you know, but, you know, if, if, if we're getting bored or if we're, you know, dismissing or we're, you know, like separating in any way, you know, in our thoughts, in our heart, you know, from our mates, then we need to really look at that. Um, so this is the pitfall. It is the beginning of the end at worst or at best a compromise, leaving you with a gnawing, unfulfilled longing. At this point, the relationship turns static. It is no longer alive, even though it may have some very pleasant features. Habit is a great temptress, pulling one towards sluggishness and inertia, so that one does not have to try and work or be alert anymore. Two people may arrange an apparently satisfactory relationship, and as the years go by, they face two possibilities. The first is that either one or both partners become openly and consciously dissatisfied, where the soul needs to surge ahead to find and to be found, so as to dissolve separateness, regardless of how much the other side of the personality fears union and is tempted by inertia. This dissatisfaction is either conscious, although in most instances the real reason for it is ignored, or it is unconscious. In either case, the dissatisfaction is stronger than the temptation of the comfort of inertia and sluggishness. Then the marriage will be disrupted, and one or both partners will delude themselves into thinking that with a new partner it will be different particularly after Eros has perhaps struck again, right? So something else catches our eye outside of the current relationship. As long as this principle is not understood, a person may go from one partnership to another, sustaining feelings only as long as Eros is at work. The second possibility is that the temptation of a semblance of peace is stronger, and then the partners may remain together and may certainly fulfill something together. But a great unfulfilled need will always lurk in their souls. Since men by nature embody more of the active and adventurous principle, they tend to be polygamous and are therefore more tempted by infidelity than women. Thus you can also understand that what the underlying motive for men's inclination to be unfaithful is. Women tend much more to be passive because they carry more of the receptive principle and are therefore better prepared to compromise. This is why they tend to be monogamous. Of course, there are exceptions in both sexes. Such infidelity is often as puzzling to the active partner as to the victim. They do not understand themselves. 
The unfaithful one may suffer just as much as the one whose trust has been betrayed. In the situation <coughs> where compromise is chosen, both people stagnate, at least in one very important aspect of their soul development. They find refuge in the steady comfort of their relationship. They may even believe that they are happy in it, and thus may be, that may be true to some degree. The advantages of friendship, companionship, mutual respect, and a pleasant life together with a well-established routine outweigh the unrest of the soul, and the partners may have enough discipline to remain faithful to one another. Yet an important element of their relationship is missing, the revealing of soul to soul as much as possible. You know, and, and in some ways, different relationships are different. So it doesn't have to be that, you know, we're using our mates as our constant, you know, therapists or, you know, sharing everything. But it, there is this kind of way that we're interested in each other. We want to bring out what the other person is interested in, right? You know, and, and we want to support them in following their own bliss, right? And that kind of thing. So there's this, you know, way that, you know, we want to support them in revealing their soul. And, and then I think we also can do the same. So true marriage. Only when two people do this, can they be purified together and thus help each other. Two developed souls can fulfill one another by revealing themselves, by searching the depths of each other's soul. And so this can go very deep into, you know, a very... You know, I know like the teachers at Seven Oaks, you know, Donovan and Susan, you know, like they they were, you know, deeply always revealing and speaking and, you know, confronting, you know, and questioning each other, you know, and, and being each other's teachers. And and that can happen sometimes, you know, you don't want to be in a one up, one down relationship, you know, because in a marriage, you really need to have that sense of equality. But when you know, wherever you are, if you are, you know, both in that equal space, right, you know, then it's kind of like taking turns and, you know, revealing and challenging and, and discovering more, you know, helping the other person discover more what, what's within them. And sometimes that happens by, you know, our questioning them, our, you know, feeling affected by, you know, some energy that, you know, is there, but, you know, we want to, you know, invite that exploration and not, again, get into the tug of war or the demand or the, you know, judgment with the partner. So thus, what is in each soul will emerge. So like, you know, by searching the depths, you know, then we're kind of calling forth what is in the other person. And thus, what is in each soul will emerge into their conscious minds and purification will take place. Then the life spark is maintained so that the relationship can never stagnate and degenerate into a dead end. For you who are on this path and follow the various steps of these teachings, it will be easier to overcome the pitfalls and dangers of the marital relationship and to repair damage that has occurred unwittingly. In this way, my dear friends, you not only maintain Eros, that vibrating life force, but you also transform it into true love. Only in a true partnership of love and eros can you discover in your partner new levels of being you have not heretofore perceived. And you yourself will be purified also by putting away your pride and revealing yourself as you really are. Your relationship will always be new regardless of how well you think you know each other already. All masks must fall, not only those on the surface, but even those deeper down that you may not have even been aware of. Then your love will remain alive. It will never be stag static. It will never stagnate. You will never have to search elsewhere. There is so much to see and discover in this land of the other soul you have chosen, whom you continue to respect, but in whom you seem to miss the life spark that once brought you together. You will never have to be afraid of losing the love of your beloved. This fear will be justified only if you refrain from risking the journey of self-revelation together. This, my friend, is marriage in its true sense. And this is the only way it can be the glory it is supposed to be. 
separateness. Each of you should think deeply about whether you are afraid to leave the four walls of your own separateness. Some of my friends are unaware that to stay separate is almost a conscious wish. I mean, most of us can feel like where, you know, we, you know, like we want to connect, we want to be with others, but, you know, like only to a certain amount or only, you know, like so much or, you know, whatever. And, that, you know, again, we, it's important to have boundaries and, you know, also have some kind of sense of, you know, not enmeshment, you know, but, you know, there is also like a great fear that we have of truly connecting with each other. And so, you know, this is a part of why I saying, you know, like it's through these, you know, deep relationships of our partners that, you know, we can overcome some of that and experience, you know, what its potential really is. So when we have this, you know, desire for being connected, you desire marriage because one part of you yearns for it and also because you don't want to be alone, right? Quite superficial and vain reasons may be added to explain the deep yearning within your soul. But aside from this yearning and aside from the superficial and selfish motives of your unfulfilled desire for partnership, there must also be an unwillingness to risk the journey and adventures of revealing yourself. So notice, like, are you, is it easy for you to just, you know, share with your partner? you know, about who you are, what you're feeling, what's what's there. And, you know, sometimes we've picked partners that it's not really safe to do that. So I'm not just saying in general, but, you know, like like in in your own being, right, a lot of times because of our history, we have a generalized, you know, expectation that says, you know, you better not, you know, share too much or be too honest or authentic, you know, like you have to kind of hide yourself. Just kind of like look inside and see if you have, you know, that kind of old wound, old imprint that, you know, makes you feel unsafe, right, to open yourself to another person and feel to the extent that that might live in you, you know, and you can kind of explore this as you go in your life with different partners, but to, to be aware, right, that <laughs> you also are holding back. Should you find yourself alone, you may, with this knowledge and this truth, repair the damage you've done to the soul by harboring wrong concepts in your unconscious. You may discover your fear of the great adventurous journey with another, which will explain why you're alone. And there's many reasons, you know, why people are alone, you know, but this can be definitely one of them to explore. So this understanding should prove helpful and may even enable your emotions to change sufficiently so that your outer life may change too. This depends on you. Whoever is unwilling to take the risk of this great adventure cannot succeed in the greatest. Oh, if you're unwilling to take the risk, then you can't succeed, right? You know, so, <clears throat> and, you know, there's some ways in which, you know, we we may have like lots of, journeys that we're on and reasons, like I said, you know, but it's like the guide is saying where we have a longing, an unmet longing for something, you know, and especially if it's a healthy longing, like the longing for a relationship, right? He says that, you know, if we're in that place of wanting longing and not having it, then that's where we go inside and try to seek where we might have our own inner no current, our own re inner resistance, our own inner fear of something and, and, you know, assumptions about how a relationship will break our hearts or, you know, some, some you know, again, generalization that, that we often have in, embedded in our unconscious from past history with relationship, from what we saw with our parents, from past lives. So we're working through all of this stuff and so lots of dynamics in, in the relationship journey. Choice of partner. Only when you meet love, life, and the other being in such readiness will you be able to bestow the greatest gift on your beloved, namely your true self. And then you must inevitably receive the same gift from your beloved. 
But to do that, a certain emotional and spiritual maturity has to exist. If this maturity is present, you will intuitively choose the right partner, one who has, in essence, the same maturity and readiness to embark on this journey. The choice of a partner who is unwilling comes out of the hidden fear of undertaking the journey yourself. You magnetically draw people and situations toward you that correspond to your subconscious fears and desires. You know that humanity on the whole is very far away from this ideal of the marriage of true selves, but that does not change the idea or the ideal. In the meantime, you have to learn to make the best of it. And you who are fortunate enough to be on this path can learn much wherever you stand, be it only in understanding why you cannot realize the happiness that a part of your soul yearns for. To discover that is already a great deal and will enable you in this life or in future lives to get nearer to the realization of what you yearn for. Whatever your situation is, whether you have a partner or are alone, search your heart and it will furnish you the answer to your conflict. The answer must come from within yourself and in all probability it will relate to your own fear, unwillingness and ignorance of the facts. Search, and you will know. Understand that God's purpose in the partnership of love is the complete mutual revelation of one soul to another, not just a partial revelation. Physical revelation is easy for many. Emotionally, you share to a certain degree, usually as far as arrows carries you. But then you lock the door, and that is the moment your troubles begin. There are many who are not willing to reveal anything, they want to remain aloof and alone, and they oops, will not touch the experience of revealing themselves and of finding the soul of the other person. They avoid this in every way they can. So Eros says a bridge. My dear ones, once again, understand how important the erotic principle is in your sphere. It helps many who may be unwilling and unprepared for the love experience. It is what you call falling in love or romance. Through Eros, the personality gets a taste of what the ideal love could be. As I said before, many use this feeling of happiness carelessly and greedily, never passing the threshold into true love. True love demands much more of people in a spiritual sense. If they do not meet this demand, they forfeit the goal for which their soul strives. This extreme of hunting for romance is as wrong as the other, where not even the potent force of arrows can entire, enter the tightly locked door. But in most cases, when the door is not too tightly bolted, arrows does come to you at certain stages of your life. Whether you can then use arrows as a bridge to love depends on you. It depends on your development, your willingness, your courage, your humility, and your ability to reveal yourself. So, you know, so just feel that kind of sort of standing naked as you are in front of, you know, the other, you know, even God, right? You know, this is, this is a part of sort of, we just have to be as we are. And, you know, a lot of our, you know, recognition of who we are is tainted or distorted by, you know, self-judgment and, and our duality within our own self. And so, you know, a lot of this, you know, also requires our own sort of relationship with ourself that is also humble and, you know, like, willing to reveal ourself to ourself and not to judge ourself, you know, and to have the, you know, courage to face our mistakes or, you know, recognize, you know, sometimes our errors and that sort of thing. So, you know, this is a kind of big journey. So he's saying, okay, are there any questions in connection with the subject, my dear friends? And I think there's a section of Q and A's here. So question. When you talk about the revelation of a soul to another, do you mean that on a higher level, this is the way the soul reveals itself to God? Answer, it is the same thing. 
But before you can truly reveal yourself to God, you have to learn to reveal yourself to another human being. And when you do that, you reveal yourself to God too. Many people want to start with revealing themselves to the personal God, but actually deep in their hearts, such revelation to God is only a subterfuge because it is abstract and remote. No other human being can see or hear what they reveal. They are still alone. One does not have to do the one thing that seems so risky, requires so much humility, and thus threatens to be humiliating. By revealing yourself to another human being, you accomplish so much that you cannot be that cannot be accomplished by revelation to God, who knows you anyway, and who do really does not need your revelation. When you find the other soul and meet it, you fulfill your destiny. When you find another soul, you also find another particle of God. And if you reveal your own soul, you reveal a particle of God and give something divine to another person. When Eros comes to you, it will lift you up far enough so that you will sense and know that it is in you that longs for this experience. Know what it is in you that longs for this experience. And what is your true self, which is longing to reveal itself without Eros you are merely aware of the lazy outer layers. Do not avoid Eros when it wants to come to you. If you understand the spiritual idea behind it, you will use it wisely. God will then be able to lead you and enable you to make the best of helping another being and yourself on the way to true love, of which purification must be an integral part. Although your purification work through a deeply committed relationship manifests differently than it does in the work on this path. It will help you toward a purification of the same order. So, you know, we can do our internal work and then, but also this work with each other is very powerful. It is possible for a soul to be, so it's another question. Is it possible for a soul to be so rich that it can reveal itself to more than one soul? Answer, my dear friend, <clears throat> do you say that facetiously? Question, no, I do not. I am asking whether polygamy is within the scheme of spiritual law. So this is where, again, you know, people have different opinions and the guide says, you know, it's no, no doctrine, you know, but to try things on or to like listen and, and discern within our own heart. So his answer, you know, I know there's kind of a new group of people into polyamory, you know, and I kind of agree with the guide here, but, you know, it's like, again, it's not something that you can just, you know, say, oh, you should do this, right? So the guide is not about controlling us or telling us that way. But he's he is kind of saying unequivocally that, you know, polygamy isn't really within the scheme of the spiritual development, that there's a kind of subterfuge. The personality is looking for the right partner, and either the person is too immature to have found the right partner or the right partner is there and the polygamous person is simply carried away by Eros's momentum, never lifting this force up into the volitional love that demands overcoming and working in order to pass the threshold I mentioned before. So in cases like this, the one with an adventurous personality is looking and looking, always finding another part of a being, always revealing himself or herself only so far and no further or perhaps each time revealing another facet of his or her personality. However, when it comes to the inner nucleus, the door is shut. Eros then departs and a new search is started. Each time it is a disappointment that can only be understood when you grasp these truths. Raw sexual instinct also enters into the longing for this great journey, but sexual satisfaction begins to suffer if the relationship is not kept on the level I show you here. It is, in fact, inevitably of short duration. There is no richness in revealing oneself to many. In such cases, one either reveals the same wares all over again to new partners, or as I said before, one displays different facets of one's personality. The more partners you try to share yourself with, the less you give to each. That is inevitably so. It cannot be different. Question. 
Certain people believe that they can cut out sex and eros and the desire for a partner and live completely for love of humanity. Do you think it is possible that a man or a woman can swear off this part of life? Answer. It is possible, but it is certainly not healthy or honest. I might say that there is perhaps one person in 10 million who may have such a task. That may be possible. It may be in karma for a particular soul who has already developed this far, has gone through the true partnership experience and comes for a specific mission. There may also be certain karmic debts that have to be paid off. In most cases, and here I can safely generalize, avoidance of partnership is unhealthy. It is an escape. The real reason is fear of love, fear of the life experience. But the fearful renunciation is rationalized as a sacrifice. To anyone who would come to me with such a problem, I would say, examine yourself. Go below the surface layers of your conscious reasoning and explanations for your attitude in this respect. Try to find out whether you fear love and disappointment. Isn't it more comfortable to just live for yourself and have no difficulties? Isn't really this what you feel deep inside and what you want to cover up with other reasons? The great humanitarian work you want to do may be for a worthy cause indeed, but do you really think one excludes the other? Wouldn't it be much more likely that the great task you have taken upon yourself would be better fulfilled if you learned personal love too? If all these questions were truthfully answered, the person would be bound to see that he or she is escaping. Personal love and fulfillment is man and woman's destiny in most cases, for so much can be learned in personal love that cannot be attained in any other way. And to form a durable and solid relationship in a marriage is the greatest victory a human being can achieve, for it is one of the most difficult things there is, as you can well see in your world. This life experience will bring the soul closer to God than lukewarm good deeds. Question. I was going to ask a question in connection with my previous one. Celibacy is supposed to be a highly spiritualized form of development in certain religious sects. On the other hand, polygamy is also recognized in some religions, the Mormons, for instance. I understand what you said, but how do you justify these attitudes on the part of people who are supposed to look for unity with God? Answer. There is human error in every religion. In one religion, it may be one kind of error in another religion, another. Here you simply have two extremes. When such dogmas or rules come into existence in the various religions, rather at one extreme or another, it's always a rationalization and subterfuge to which the individual soul constantly resorts. This is an attempt to explain away the countercurrents of their fearful or greedy soul with good motives. There is a common belief that anything pertaining to sexuality is sinful, that sex instinct arises already in the infant, the more immature the creature the more sexuality is separated from love, and therefore the more selfish it is. Anything without love is sinful, if you want to use this word. Nothing that is coupled with love is wrong or sinful. So I think that's like the main understanding and key for all of this, you know, and including all of the, you know, other questions around gender and sexuality. In the growing child who is naturally immature, the sex drive will first manifest selfishly. Only if and when the whole personality grows and matures harmoniously will sex become integrated with love. Out of ignorance, humanity has long believed that sex as such is sinful. Therefore, it was kept hidden, and this part of the personality could not grow up. Nothing that remains in hiding can grow. You know that. Therefore, even in many grown-ups, sex remains childish and separate from love. And this, in turn, has led humanity to believe that sexuality is a sin and that the truly spiritual person must abstain from it. Thus, one of those oft-mentioned vicious circles came into existence. Because of the belief that sex was sinful, the instinct could not grow and meld with the love force. Consequently, sex, in fact, often is selfish and loveless, raw and animalistic. If people would realize, and they are beginning to do so increasingly, that the sex instinct is as natural and God-given as any other universal force, 
and in itself not more sinful than any other existing force, they would break this vicious circle, and more human beings would let their sex drives mature and mingle with love and with eros for that matter. How many people exist for whom sex is completely separate from love? They not only suffer from bad conscience when the sex urge manifests, but they also find themselves in the position of being unable to handle sexual feelings with the person they really love. Because of the distorted conditions and the vicious circle just described, humanity came to believe that you cannot find God when you respond to your sexual urges. This is all wrong. You cannot kill off something that is a lie. You can only hide it so that it will come out in other ways which may be much more harmful. Only in the very rarest cases does the sex force really become constructively sublimated and make this creative force manifest in other realms. Real sublimation can never occur when it is motivated by fear and used in this escape. Does that answer your question? Perfectly. Thank you. How does friendship between two people fit into this picture? Answer. Friendship is brotherly love. Such friendship can also exist between man and woman. Eros may want to sneak in, but reason and will can still direct the way in which the feelings take their course. Discretion and a healthy balance between reason, emotion, and will are necessary to prevent the feelings from going into an improper channel. Question. Is divorce against spiritual law? Answer. Not necessarily. We do not have fixed rules like that. There are cases when divorce is an easy way out, a mere escape. There are other cases when divorce is reasonable because the choice to marry was made in immaturity and both partners lack the desire to fulfill the responsibility of marriage in its true sense. If only one or neither is willing, divorce is better than staying together and making a farce out of marriage. Unless both are willing to take this journey together, it is better to break clean than to let one prevent the growth of the other. That, of course, happens. It is better to terminate a mistake than to remain indefinitely in it without finding an effective remedy. To generalize that divorce is always wrong is just as incorrect as to say that it is always right. One should not, however, leave a marriage lightly. Even though it was a mistake and does not work, one should try to find the reasons and do one's very best to search out and perhaps get over the hurdles that are in the way. If both are in any way willing, for one should certainly do one's best, even if the marriage is not the ideal experience. Few people are ready and mature enough for it. And you can make yourself ready by trying to make the best of your past mistakes and learn from them. My dearest friends, think carefully about what I have said. There is much food for thought in what I told you for each of you here and for all of those who will read my words. This is not a single person. There is not a single person who cannot learn something from them. I want to close this lecture with the assurance to all of you that we in the spirit world are deeply grateful to God for your efforts, for your growth. It is our greatest joy and our greatest happiness. And so my dear ones, receive the blessings of the Lord again. May your hearts be filled by this wonderful strength coming to you from the world of light and truth. Go in peace and in happiness, my dear ones, each of you, be in God. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to stop the share. And, uh, I will share. Yes. That's what I was Whoa. doing, was opening it up for others. So just stopping the, taking off the sharing of the, so we can see each other and talk a little. So, hi. <laughs> hi. Did you have something you wanted to say? Yeah, I was going to, my first reaction was, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a while since I've uh, visited um the lectures i used to listen to them and read them um um almost daily there for not too and during the probably during the pandemic time i think it was and um i only got up to about 15 or something the first 15 um 
and I found them to be very interesting. I liked them a lot. I listened to the the spoken ones, the right? Ones that, and um, so I listened, and I played cards while I was listening, and so it would come in without me like trying to figure out what they're saying and everything. Uh huh. And then listen again and again because the more I listen, the more it would kind of penetrate in exactly to what and because I used to before they had that, I used to um read them and I would like get caught. So, you know, one pair just one pair, I guess as far as one paragraph, and I'd be caught by, you know, so many different things. And then I fall asleep, you know, that'd be my reaction to the whole thing. And Right. Like that kind of thing. So I like a lot the 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 spoken ones. And um but anyway, so I so I, and I hadn't gotten as far as the arrows, but I did study the arrows when I was in path work. Right. And um and it's it's very interesting because I'm I'm single. And so it's very interesting hearing what he has to say and everything and kind of where I'm at in my journey of being single because it wasn't what I wanted or planned. Um, but according to the guide, I must have, that must have been a choice I made, which by the way, I, in um, my other spiritual life, I was um, informed by the higher beings that are connected by me that I chose I mean, I remember choosing when I was a child not to get married. Interesting. And um, I, it, as I got old, of course, I forgot about that. And I, I when I was wanting what everyone else was wanting, mm -hmm. was natural. And um, I, um, um, but I never saw myself. A lot of people say I saw myself getting going down the aisle and the, you know, or something. I never saw any of that, and so I was like, "Huh, I'm like, you know, that's kind." Of, this is before I remembered or that I that I had actually chosen not to get married, and that was during a certain period. I don't think that's necessarily applicable now. That was like during a certain period of my life where it was kind of like maybe during the period where I would have children or something. Maybe it right. was like something like during that. And, um, but, um, and, but as it seems from that lecture that the guide is really, his main focus is on people who are in partnership or in a certain line or something it's kind of like um you know i'll have to like i mean this is my first entree back into the lectures in a long time you know years and um so it's kind of, when i first was listening to it and everything you know i was it was i just was kind of like wow I remember the um the 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 um the guide has a lot to say. He's got a lot of and um he's got a lot to say. I'm 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 interested in what he has to say because you know I have come to believe certain things and there are certain things I've just left open. I I don't know what the answer is. I hardly know the answer in myself, let alone to have general answers but but i do have my own particular you know um belief systems and so i found it i found it very fascinating and interesting i'll make one other comment and then i'll i'll stop talking and listen um his comment about sexuality is a normal thing and suppressing all that i found that very interesting i want to read more about that or or i want to read it'd be interesting again if if um, I want, let me, I'm jumping here. And let me back up. I found that to be very interesting with his analysis of sexual impulse and sexuality in our culture. I found that to be very interesting because now that I'm, uh, you can, probably can relate to this, Darlene. I don't know about the other people in the session can, but I'm now 70 years old. And um, I've lo I've lost weight. I'm I'm back to the weight I wore I was in college, and um, 
and my horn and I'm past menopause. And so my hormones are different now. And I remember hearing a woman say um, to me, um, oh, I, you know, I, once I lost, it was like she associated with the hormone, this desire to be with the opposite sex. Mm. And she got to a certain point in her life where it dropped. She no longer had that. And she was so grateful that it dropped and that all the stuff associated with it. And I always thought that was kind of interesting. I wasn't sure what I thought about it because I hadn't experienced anything like that. And But I have experienced something like that now. And um, I find that kind of interesting. And yet I'm I'm more like, have I really lost that desire? Is that, have I really lost the desire? Is just not, I don't have as much, I don't have as much ump, but um, um, I don't know if I've actually totally lost it, but I really can understand that desire for another um, that the lecturer talks about. It was very, um, it was heavy. For me, it was heavy. And, um, and it not, I wouldn't have even known that until I stopped having it like that woman talked about. And no, I understand. I think, yeah. I, and I think there is like for the women, like, you know, because of the distortion and sexuality, there is like a, a freedom in some ways of being out of that, you know, kind of time frame that where there is that sort of focus and demand and sort of all consuming you know, thing that seems to take over. Is that what you're mean, you meaning? As am I? I, I wasn't. You? I'm not really quite sure what I mean. I just am aware of the feelings and the freedom that you speak of. There's a freedom that is like, oh God, thank God. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, I had no idea how heavy that was, but it was like that feeling was almost crazy making um for me um and um um and i it probably has to do with the sexual distortions that are applicable in this society and i probably was working with a lot of that and it was always kind of like you know as a woman you know we work with and I don't know if the guy even talks about this. We work with so much distortion and we work with so much prejudice that, um, and it's so much, and we, it's just part of our being. We, there's nothing we can, we don't even think that there's another way. It's just as part of the way. I mean, it's kind of like that kind of thing, but, um, I mean, God have mercy on all of us. Men and women, because men probably have their own version of that right. as well. I mean, it's not just us. It's no, no, like it's it's all the, the yeah. You know, again, he's talking about you know, like it's it gets so distorted, you know, and there is a divine and higher expression that you know, hopefully, we can find and and learn to get to. But but yeah, you know, I think the current state and and that is saying, you know, it's better than you know, like keep going for it or. You know, because it's only in the engagement, you know, if we think, oh, God, that's so terrible. I'm just <laughs> I'm out of the, the circulation or something, you know, then, you know, that's also a, a way that we're kind of not able to learn as much, you know. So and I know many women, you know, like that have just gone through, you know, so much kind of harassment and pressure and, you know, confusion and and all of that. But, you know, I also you know, we have our own demands and pressure and, you know, stuff too. So, you know, it's, it's like, there's both sides and even it's like a lot of the couples work, you know, it's like, I just see so much, you know, like how difficult it is for us to do what he's talking about in this lecture, which is, you know, like to, like I loved about, you know, like just reveal, you know, we want to reveal ourselves and we want to, you know, like honor what we're seeing in the other person's revelation, you know, and, and it's usually just the opposite of that, you know, we're, you know, unhappy, critical, 
you know, frustrated with each other to no end. <laughs> you know, one ego wanting me to have the other ego be the way that it wants it, you know, and not having any generosity of spirit or that, you know. So when the arrows goes, you know, and it's just the, like the will that wants the other person to be the way they want, I think we lose all connection with real love. And then we're, you know, he's saying it's better to just <laughs> try again or give up. So Selena's well, writing, I Sarah. I, I was very, I was very grateful to hear that he, he, he was saying that. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I was no, like, I think it's, <laughs> I thought it was, um, it, it seemed very, um, it seemed very elevated that he said that. Yeah, exactly. So I'm Selena sorry, wrote I'm in. Like, a, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to respond. Selena put in the chat, you know, a question. So let me. Okay, I'm going to like, I'm going to beg off now. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I, thank you. I it was it. great to see you. Yeah, glad, glad you enjoyed it. And it is, I mean, it's just a great meditation or exploration. So thanks for joining. Is there. Okay. So. So, yeah, Selena, you know, she says, even if a couple seems outwardly incompatible, if they are both willing to do the work, can they still have a successful relationship marriage? And, you know, I think really, you know, I mean, if you do the work, you can really either have that be a successful relationship or you will successfully and, you know, healthily separate. Right. You know, it won't be in rancor. It won't be in hostility, you know. So so I think really that's kind of the best thing to do is, you know, for both partners to do their work. Right. And then also sometimes, you know, the couple's work and that, you know, it's amazing how much that that can do, even when it appears from the outside, you know, that there's a lot of difficulty. But oftentimes if the outside is not doing so good, the partners are not really totally willing to get into the depth of what needs to be done. So that's the catch, right? So if both are really willing to do the work, then it will work. Does that make sense? Looks like you're still muted. I don't know if you're trying to answer or not. Oh yes, it it does. And from what the guy was saying, I I I assume that that part was true. Um, and then that makes sense. But also, um, sometimes people can say they want to do the work or kind of put on a, a um an air or a front that they want to, but they're not really showing up. Which is what you just alluded to right most most of the couples you know when they start this work you know they want they really want to go to somebody to referee and tell them that they're right and the other partner is wrong so in the path work you know it's like the, it never works that way you know like the part you know and and people really need to do individual sessions and not just couples work and in those individual sessions if they're complaining about their partner, <laughs> then the helper is usually redirecting that, you know, like, so, you know, there, that may be the case, you know, but what well, we can't change the partner. And there's a way that in the dynamic, if it's bugging you, if you are unhappy with it, there's a, it's a reason for you to look at your own stuff. And so right. we don't right. even, you know, when we're looking at, relationships and issues we're looking always to look for our own responsibility for it first and most right. people are unwilling to do that level of the work they they want you know to kind of stay where they're you know they can hold to their position and the other guy is proven to be wrong somehow but i love the path work for that reason because it doesn't let anybody get away with that a lot of people leave doing the work because once they realize they can't, you know, they can't uh, get away with that. They don't want to stay. But those mm -hmm. that do stay and are willing, yeah, you know, it it makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. um, and then I didn't want to forget it. So I was typing the other question in there. Hopefully it made sense because I was 
trying to type and listen at the same time. Um, did you see it there? I saw your question about if if what you think you want from your partner, mm -hmm. uh, they will not or are unwilling to give you or your ego wants, should we seek it outside of our relationship? So this is where mm -hmm. I think that there's a discernment, right? And so the okay. first thing that I would say is when you feel like you're, you need something from your partner and they're not giving it to you, you know, like we, this is where it goes into the compulsion to recreate and overcome childhood hurts. So the first thing we have to go in and look at seeing, you know, what is it that you think that, that you want? And then, you know, a lot of times, you know, in a, in a relationship, we want to be able to demand it. Right. And so one of the right. principles right. in the path work is, is that we have to give everybody free will, you know, and we don't, Mm -hmm. You know, if you forced your partner to give you what you wanted, you wouldn't really be able to receive it because you would know that he wasn't giving it because he wanted to. He was giving it because you were demanding it and it wouldn't feel like what you wanted anyway. Right. So right. so the, the key is we have to be willing to ask for what we want. And we also have to be willing to accept no for an answer. Okay. And when the answer is no, then the question is, well, you know, like a lot of times what we're seeking from our partners is something that we're not giving to ourselves. There's some way in which yeah. we're trying yeah. to, you know, get from them something. And it's really something that, first of all, we need to, you know, be in our own authority and give to ourselves. And mm -hmm. and so that also helps. Like, so when they say no, you know, we're not thrown into chaos and lack because we have our own inner resource our own you know inner authority our own self-love our own you know ability to accept you know limitation or you know so that's kind of a mature way of uh, you know kind of dancing with a no now if you know the no is forever and and you've done your part and you've given you know and you know that that you're you know not trying to get something from him that you're not willing to give to yourself, then, then a lot of times you can, this is where he's saying, you know, you can realize that this relationship, it's not worth it. You know, it's not going to get there. You might as well leave the relationship, but he's saying you shouldn't go outside of the relationship. You should leave the relationship. Now, if you're mm -hmm. talking about certain things like friendship, you know, like, like we, we all, if we, if we want our mate to fulfill all of our needs, you know, that's a little unfair mm -hmm. too, you know, like they, they yeah. should fulfill certain of our needs and then we should have other people in our life and they should let us have other people in our lives that are mm -hmm. also filling other needs. So there's mm -hmm. this thing about the chakras that I heard one time that made sense to me. Like they said, like our primary relationship should uh, support our first third and fifth chakras and our secondary relationships should support our second, fourth and sixth. And of course, God <laughs> from the crown. So mother, the earth mother. So, so, you know, there's a kind of way that um, we do need other people and we should seek other kinds of support, you know, like a lot of relationships, you know, there's different interests. You know, my husband and I don't have mm -hmm. similar interests in everything, right? You know, we have some things the mm -hmm. same, but, but, and so, you know, what I expect from him is to support me in fulfilling those interests and those needs outside of the relationship. So if he were really possessive or, you know, like refused, you know, refused mm -hmm. to let me pursue that, you know, then there would be a right. problem, you know. Right, right. But if he's just not interested in being the same as me, that's not a problem. Mm -hmm. I don't want him to be the same as me. I want him mm -hmm. to be himself and find mm -hmm. things that he enjoys and do the things that he loves. And and I want to mm -hmm. support that. Mm -hmm. And and then, mm -hmm. you know, where we can enjoy things together, that's great. And then where we, you know, need to, we we can find, you know, friendships and other things. Now, Again, it's mm -hmm. not like sexuality, at least in my book, I would say what the guide said about, you know, yeah. more than and that's not actual what I'm relationship. About. I'm just, you know, talking about yeah, okay. interest and in things like that. Um, and then um, I think my final question is, 
those things where your ego kind of comes in and um, wants things a certain way or, or doesn't see th things going in the direction that you think you want it to be in. Um, and how to stay focused on yourself instead of judging and blaming. So that, you know, it's, it's like a process, right? And that's a part of what we do in individual sessions and in some of the group, you know, so, so each specific instance would have to be explored a little and, and, mm -hmm. and, you know, understood, you know, like specifically, but, you know, sort of in general, again, I think that the, the, the most helpful thing is to, you know, like listen to the inner voices inside. So there's a voice inside that's unhappy want something from your partner, you know, and that you're not getting it. And so like once we can, you know, like allow that voice to speak and we can hear mm -hmm. and we can ask it some questions, you know, like to understand it more deeply. And mm -hmm. also we can feel a little more sort of, well, is this, you know, like is like, like the guide says, like when we have a really intense emotional you know, need or, or reaction, like oftentimes that's coming from history. There's past issues yeah, connected. Right. With it. And so, you know, like we have to kind of sort out like, well, is the intensity of this need or this thing, you know, where is that really coming from? Right. Okay. And, and so a lot of times we want to do the healing of, some of like sort of sort of like oh i'm afraid you know if i don't get this you know like some you know i'm i'm going to die well i mean somehow we feel that emotionally right but mm -hmm. if we can support ourselves sometimes going through what we're afraid of that's how we transcend our fears and if we're controlled by our fears right if we can't you know, so like a lot of times in the in the work, you know, it is kind of initiatory. And so where we discover that we're in defense and we're afraid of feeling something. Mm -hmm. The answer is often, you know, kind of what we don't want to hear. So go feel it. Right. You know, that's the only freedom. <laughs> right. Right. And and so mm -hmm. as we learn to, you know, face and, and feel what's going on inside what we're afraid of transforms and the whole circumstance mm -hmm. transforms. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you want, um, we could, you know, talk a little more specifically to this evening, or, you know, if you want to explore more specifically, you know, we could do a session and I was going to check with you cause I'm doing this. I think I sent that weekend workshop to you coming up. Did you get it? It's the hibernaculum coming up the second or the third and fourth of February. Um, you may have, I, I get a lot of email. I don't always get to, but I'll go back and look. I'll search you. Or I can send again. You know, I was just thinking of you thinking, you know, if you wanted to, that would be another, you know, group experience. Like you came to the first one that would go a little deeper and you would have, oh, you know, yes. some time to come and spend mm -hmm. here to do, you mm -hmm. know, more of that process okay. in a group, or you can do some individual work if you feel like that might be useful. Yeah, maybe both. I just like feel, I don't know, this upheaval. And I don't know if it's just I'm going through like a transformation or something. Um, but I'm really trying to stay focused on myself. And it, it can be a bit of a challenge. So what would you say? Like, so, you know, this is the part that kind of like it's saying, you know, he's making it hard or there's some problem, you know, like that he's adding or something. No. It's like, are you blaming? No. no. Okay. No, it's me. Bye, Elizabeth. <laughs> Good night. Bye -bye. Can you get out, get out of here? <laughs> and I think if, if, if I had not done the work that I've done so far, I think you know, I might be in that blaming place and, that, you know, but that that's not true. You know, I, I know that it's not true. Um, and so, so what are you feeling? Because it's like that's it's like there's a specific 
you know, pain body that's being activated somehow, right? Mm-hmm. And and the more that, you know, it's not like we have to believe everything that the pain body wants us to believe, but we need to understand so we can help it, right? And so just kind of curious, what does the pain body say about the circumstance that you're struggling with? It feels like distrust, but there's no reason for it to be there. Okay. And so when I look deeper, I was like, okay, is it that I don't trust myself? So I'm looking at myself. Okay. And it could be mm-hmm. like, so So when you feel that distrust, can you access it kind of right in this moment in some way? Like, you know, like, is there a time particularly or something he does that brings it out? You know, just kind of trying to find a way to anchor and ground into it a little more. That, that fear feeling of distrust. Is there anything he does Nothing. that triggers it more than other times? <clears throat> or is it just always um, there? I think, like, if he's not there, and then, you know, I might feel some kind of way or something. But it kind of doesn't make sense. So as I'm thinking about it, I think it's more my own abandonment issue. Okay. Um, because... You know, he doesn't do anything to leave me worrying about anything, you know. But that's part of the work, right? You know, so it's beautiful that you can see, well, this is still coming up, but I don't Mm -hmm. think that there's really cause. So that must mean it's buried in my deep unconscious. and, And so now it's using this opportunity to be coming up so we can pay attention to it and try to help it, right? You know, so... So it's not like a problem that you're, you know, it's alive in you and you're becoming aware of it, right? But now it's like, okay, what does, how can we help heal that? Like, where did that, that early trauma? Yeah, because I don't want it to come up and be like spewed into. Right, right. It's not about in in your relationship. It's like in your, in your work. Right. None yeah. of this has anything. It's all internal. It's all inner exploration. And we don't bring it to the other person until it's been well distilled and it's coming out in, mm-hmm. you know, a healthy and loving way. Right. You know, so anything that's not love, we have to transform inside of ourselves first. And so fear, you know, is kind of the thing, you know, that, that, destroys love right you know so and and where the fear comes from often is early trauma or ancestral pattern or you know something in you know maybe how your parents were together or something like that you know Mm -hmm. so you know Mm that you have to go to the source the original source of the distrust Mm -hmm. and work it from there and you know like then i think usually that will it would be good for me to book a session to explore that some more um and I look at the email I got so much I, even though I couldn't be fully present to all the other stuff going on in the background but I got so much out of this today I, I just learned so much I want to go back and read it again I mean I could do it in you know a little bit here and there but it, it was just so rich in information it just deepened my understanding and um, something else that I look at in, in reading this, like a lot of women in my family are single. And I was discussing it with my older daughter, like, you know, we've discussed it several times over the years. And, you know, I just decided for myself that I don't want that to be me. But, you know, as the guy was talking about the fear and not wanting to reveal itself, it's just like, okay, how do I not and I don't know if it's an ancestral pattern or just whatever how do I make myself aware of not stepping forth like you know because sometimes you know it's not the other person it's you that's not really stepping fully in it but you can make excuses so feel inside of yourself where you hold back But, you know, we do all of these protective kinds of holdings. We hold back, we hold in, we hold out, we hold together. 
you know, we're trying to mask, we're trying to present, you know, we're not being authentic. We're trying to, you know, like get a certain response yeah. from people, you know, or, and so we're manipulating in some way. And all of that is just grist for the mill, yeah. right? Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's like, it sounds yeah, like maybe there's sense. something, you know, for you, just like you can feel it, right? You know, some part that's yeah. saying, so go ahead and share more, reveal more, or be more open. And some part of you is saying, no, that's not okay, or that might be dangerous, or, or I can't do that. Mm -hmm. You know, so if you can mm -hmm. kind of access in this moment now, even, you know, where it is side of you in your body, you know, in your feelings, because the feelings are, you know, in the thoughts and in the body. Yeah, it's kind of like in here. Okay. Good. Yeah. And so see if you can just, you know, what it, kind of breathe, be with it, be curious, open, you know, what is this feeling in here? You know, what is it, you know? Mm -hmm. Definitely fear. Uh-huh. Okay, um, good. Um, How old does it feel? That Can you roll it back? Does it feel familiar? How long have you carried this kind of fear in your being, right? And see if you can. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling five. Uh-huh. Um, which seems obvious <laughs> considering, but um, yeah, I think, I think, I, I think that's where it's coming from. And when I think back to that time period, you know, the things that when, you know, my father left the family, you know, my, he was still around. It was a period where there was a separation where, you know, we came home and all the stuff was gone. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, right. So, and, so your little psyche, you know, like that was a huge thing. And, you know, yeah. probably the people that were could have helped you, they were also dealing with it, you know, so there was no, yeah. and so like there exactly. was no integration, exactly. right? There was not a way that you could, exactly. and so the child's conclusion yeah. Yeah. in that situation also, because, the you know, everything revolved, so, the, you know, the child kind of un, inevitably and unconsciously just assumes like that happened because I did something wrong. Yeah, and I don't know if, if I felt that at that time. What I remember is trying to figure it out. It's like my So what did you why did, what conclusion did you draw in the long run that you know, like or just emotionally, that, like what I, do you think you secretly feared or suspected was the reason that he left? I don't know. I I I don't know and I've heard that you know where you know you blame yourself or whatever but I don't feel that I just feel like a like an unanswered thing sort of like a bewilderment so um, sort of like just puzzled and kind of bereft you know why did yeah. you leave you know like I don't understand you yeah. know sort of like kind of lost my, it yeah. yeah and my personality is one to to analyze and things like that so then you have to kind of try to figure it out with your head, right? Yes, that's but exactly there, but you've tried, you've been trying, trying to do that for years, and you still don't have the answers, right? So the, the answers aren't there, right? You know, it's like, and part of it is, I think the head is trying to figure out some reason so that it can satisfy. Like the heart is is really like secretly afraid, right? You know, or secretly maybe puzzled, you know, but like I don't know that. Yeah, I you just said i think that's it right there okay you got froze so yeah uh, yeah so good yeah you know and so there's there's more to excavate right you know and so this is where yeah if you feel like you know to to do some you know more zoom sessions that would be good if you can come you know, the first weekend in February, we're doing a weekend retreat where we'll have some time in group to, you know, share and process together in some of these things, um, you know, or we can just, you know, do a few sessions, you know, going forward. But, you know, it, it does take a while to kind of really, first of all, get to that level of where it's coming from and then how to 
integrate and resolve it, right? So it it's like it's not just figuring it out and getting the answer and the spelling of it. It's kind of like a deeper inner process, yeah, right? Yeah, it's like that, you know, that body memory, because intellectually I do. We talked about You it know, later, right, like exactly. Grown. Exactly. Yeah, but that body memory is still right. there. And so that's that where, to me. So hurt is still there. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that's where to me, like we can we can use another part of our consciousness to go mm -hmm. in and connect with the yeah. body memory that is the wounded mm -hmm. part of the consciousness is the mm -hmm. you know pain body part, right? Yeah. And and so, and so something else that just came up that I was reminded of. Okay. Right then, and that is disappointment. Um so I see a, a reflexologist, but she does like some type of energy work with it. And she said I was just like releasing that, you know, like lots of disappointment over, you know, time. And I do remember experiencing re repeated disappointment. Um, So I think between, you know. Right, right. That's good. You know, yeah. The, so so the you might even see like, well, you know, am, am I sort of unwilling to be more forthcoming because I'm afraid in the long run of the disappointment, right? If it doesn't work or, you know, something like right. that. Right. So kind of holding in reserve, you know, not risking because if it doesn't work, it's too crushing. Right. Mm -hmm. And the, the, you know, I'm kind of protecting or saving myself from that in case. Hmm. Right, but then that doesn't leave room for what we learned about in this. Right, exactly. Process. So then you don't have the, then you can't. Yeah. So, so right. So, so there's a risk, you know, this is part of the, the healing of that, you know, and it doesn't seem to be any way forward other than, you know, risking the dreaded death, you know, like a lot of times mm -hmm. we talk about a shaman's death, right? You know, like, mm -hmm. like what we were terrified, what we experienced in childhood and then traumatized mm -hmm. us. It's like, it's not mm -hmm. like we have to go and get re-traumatized. But we do have to risk in, and we have to go in with some more tools and some more right. uh, so capacity. Are we risking risking feeling that way again? Is that what it is? Yeah, both. You know, both knowing that you know, as a child, that disappointment was unbearable in some ways, right? You know, right, and too right, too right. frequent mm -hmm. and too constant, right? You know, mm -hmm. you know, as an adult. It's a feeling, you know, the guide says what we're mm -hmm. always defending against is our feelings and it's just a feeling and it's not going to mm -hmm. kill you, you know. So when mm -hmm. we can learn to, so what part of what was so painful about disappointment was there was nobody to sympathize or hold or empathize with, you yeah. know, like to be with us yeah. and say, oh, I'm sorry, you, you know, that didn't happen yeah. and I know how you feel and, you know, and things are going to get better. And of course, back then, maybe even it was promise after promise that was disappointed and things didn't mm -hmm. get better. And for children, time takes forever. And it's, you know, so like the consciousness, you know, is like trapped in this thing of, oh, it's going to be this way and I, I can't ever change, you know, and, and I'm lost and damned in disappointment. Mm -hmm. But the truth is that life is, mm -hmm. has, you know, has joy and has sorrow, has, you know, the good moments and the bad has the, you know, like mm -hmm. times when we get what we want and the times when we don't, you know. And so mm -hmm. there's a way that the guide says from the child consciousness that, you know, like feels like it's it's the end of the world if everything isn't perfect. And if one little thing is off, right. you know, everything is terrible. Right. You know, so so that child consciousness has to kind of gain resilience and flexibility and acceptance of you know, life has all of these things, you know, it has joy and fulfillment and it has disappointment and loss and, you know, and that we mm -hmm. can be, you know, holding ourselves through those feelings and not judging and it's not our fault, you know, or we can learn if we contributed, you know, so we can grow from it. But, you know, there's no shame, there's no blame, there's no, you know, like egoic a lot of times the child, you know, looks at things that happen. And like you said, you know, you don't understand. It's either too puzzling and overwhelming or the child thinks, mm -hmm. well, I don't understand it, but it must have been something with me because, you know, like I'm, you know, this is every time 
you know, I tried, you know, I got the same thing or whatever, right? You know, so the child draws yeah. these conclusions yeah. in some way. And usually, usually there's some kind of distortion. You know, it's a wrong conclusion right. in some way. Mm -hmm. And if we can help see what that is, then our adult can go in and talk to the child and explain to the child and hold the child, you know, and let the child mm -hmm. feel her disappointment and kind of like feelings like we, we got stuck in disappointment because we couldn't surrender to it and let it wash over us and then leave. You know, it kind of just kept recycling because we got stuck in it. And so right. there's a way to learn how to surf our feelings so that mm -hmm. we don't, you know, like like we move through them and freely. Oops, I think I just lost you. <laughs> I'm going to end the recording, I guess. <laughs>